Right. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening. Welcome to Topology Open Magazine webinar. Uh, this is the fourth uh, session. Uh, today we have a Professor. We're honored to have Professor James Guest from John Hopkins University to chair this session. Uh, and we have five wonderful speakers. Uh, Professor James Guest, please go ahead. Muted. Of course, I started off muted, right? Uh, thank, thanks, Jun. Thanks for uh, handing it off to me. Thanks for the taking the initiative to get this webinar going to you and the other uh, organizers of Delft and DTU. That's uh, a great initiative. It's great to see familiar faces and get connected and see some great topology optimization research. So thank you for that. And thank you for the opportunity uh, to host. Uh, I did want to mention the next uh, webinar will be September 22nd, hosted by Ching Lee at University of Sydney. Um, so keep an eye out for that uh, announcement and, and put a placeholder in your calendar for the same time, September 22nd. Um, we did want to mention that this webinar is endorsed by ISMO, and, and I'm, I'm happy to say that we should have a newsletter out in the next few weeks uh, to provide some updates on the society activities and initiatives that the executive committee is taking. So keep an eye out for that in your email. Um, so today we have a great group of speakers uh, across a couple different areas, which uh, it was intentional. Uh, Professor Oda Demir will be giving the keynote, followed by uh, Dr. Le uh, Lisa Noel, uh, Professor Mike Xi, Kai James, and uh, Joe Alexanderson. So Oded, I'll hand it off to you and let you take the lead. And for those new, we'll, we'll have an opportunity for questions immediately following the talk, a few questions followed by a discussion at the end of the five talks. So Oded, please. Yes, thank you very much. So can everybody see my uh, screen? Yes. Yep. Yeah. OK, so first I want to thank, of course, uh, the main organizers of this event. I think it's a very good initiative, and it's very nice to see familiar faces and some familiar names for those who don't show their camera um, and have this opportunity to see the community and discuss research. And of course, I want to thank Jamie for giving us the opportunity to uh, have a longer talk and maybe get a little bit more into details and into the discussion of this uh, of this paper. So um, um, the topic will be a, a paper on mixed uh, projection and density-based topology optimization with applications to structural assemblies. This is a joint work with uh, Nicolò Polini during his uh, short postdoc period with me before he left on to Denmark and never came back and still there doing some different postdoc works. Uh, so he actually did most of the actual work. So this is the paper. It was published in SMO, I think, roughly a year ago. Um, the motivation came from a, a problem we were facing during a, a industrial collaboration around the topic of uh, topology optimization and additive manufacturing for aerospace structures in titanium. And one of the challenges of this uh, project, they wanted to, um, um, to uh, additively manufacture a rib for a um, for a small jet, a business jet. Uh, this is the rib, basically. They wanted to redesign it using topology optimization and then print it. And specifically, the challenge here was that uh, the size of this rib is roughly, the length is roughly 600 millimeters. It's bigger than a common AM uh, facility in metals. Um, and they wanted to test the capabilities of printing uh, a bigger part in separate parts and then welding it. And the idea is that welding of printed parts is, is roughly or mainly an unknown, unknown territory. There are many question marks. Um, and we were trying during the project to figure out what are the constraints actually, what do we need to imp impose during this uh, uh, optimization process? Is it only material properties or geometrical limitations? Uh, we didn't get many answers. So we decided uh, in our research to focus on the conceptual geometric problem of designing a part that we know beforehand that needs to be um, um, manufactured in several parts, partitioned, and then assembled together later uh, in welding or in some other assembly procedure. So this is the motivation for this specific work. So the main idea here is that um, uh, if you optimize a design and later search for the best way to partition it, this may result in a suboptimal or maybe even infeasible result with respect to the actual manufacturing scenario. So if we look um, into the um, a, a standard topology optimization result, looking at this beam, and we have a certain maximum manufacturable size, which is smaller than the size of the actual beam, then we could first design it and then try to find the best 
region or way to partition it into parts which actually obey this uh, maximum manufacturable size. And then we can find different cuts, different ways to partition it. But eventually, this may lead to um, a suboptimal result because the actual material properties and geometric limitations at these interfaces were not taken into account during the optimization. Um, so the idea is to try to take this into account uh, simultaneously. So finding the design of the part, the complete part, and its partitioning um, in a concurrent process where uh, certain properties of this partition or certain properties of the cut region are taken into account during the optimization. So the problem formulation is roughly like this. So for the simplest case of a 2D structure with one cut, we basically impose a maximum manufacturable size. So let's say the size of the whole design is slightly bigger than the maximum manufacturable size. And then we basically need to design um, the distribution of material within the complete part and a certain cut which partitions this whole design into two parts where there's a certain region for this cut which will uh, eventually obey the maximum manufacturable size. And this is basically uh, posed as a, a coupled uh, optimization problem of density and shape. So density distribution for the black question marks of the actual material distribution and a certain shape distribution which is corresponds to the coordinates of the of this uh, geometric cut between two pieces of the of the complete part. So rho is the common density based design field and x are the geometric coordinates of the cut and the constraints they can contain different controls over uh, over the design near the cut. So if you have different limitations regarding volume, feature size, material properties, we can impose them uh, with a with certain number of constraints related to this, to this cut. Um, so generalizing this a little bit, uh, the problem statement is, a, is basically a shape and a freeform topology optimization coupled by some geometric projection. So eventually this cut is a geometric feature which we will use certain projection functions in order to connect it in a way and couple it uh, to the otherwise freeform topology which is evolving in the other regions outside of this cut. So the basic question is how to optimally embed, uh, if we generalize it again, embed a certain discrete object within an otherwise freeform uh, continuum domain. And this can, can take different forms. And actually in the end of this, uh, this talk, we have a, a short literature review of different works. So we actually later discovered there are several approaches to these, to these problems and several different motivations. Um, uh, I, I sketch here certain examples which uh, brought us into the certain way that we decided to parameterize it, but certain ideas could be like embedding a rebar in concrete. So if you have a steel rebar, it needs to be covered by concrete. So this is a discrete object that needs to be embedded within a continuum. Uh, later, we looked at a post-tensioning tendon, again, in the, in the uh, realm of concrete and pre-tensed concrete, uh, pre-stressed concrete, uh, how to embed a certain tendon within the design. Uh, now we're looking at the cut for a later assembly, but this can also be, for example, a flexible void, which are certain different ideas of how to do this, how to embed a flexible void within an otherwise freeform topology. Uh, so there are different aspects of this in different applications. Um, the talk will focus on, on the cut um, and the application for assembly, but uh, the actual parameterization personally for us uh, was coming from uh, embedded rebars and embedded post-tensioning tendons. So I will briefly review this and, and just show how this evolved. So um, we basically, several years ago, started looking at concrete and rebars and reinforcement. And the idea here was that the rebars are discrete objects. They're parameterized with a ground structure. Um, and the concrete is a continuum. And you want to be able to guarantee that the rebars are actually covered by concrete. So you don't want to have these artifacts like here where the holes are actually strengthened by floating rebars, which are not covered by actual concrete. And this was achieved by a simple filter. So this filter basically says that you will only have a rebar if it is actually surrounded by concrete in the vicinity of the rebar. And this gives the result in the bottom where we basically have rebars only where they are strongly embedded within the concrete. Um, and this, the same idea was later extended to the case of a of post-tensioning of concrete. So basically in, in pre-stressed concrete, we would like to uh, design the, the tendon, the, the pre-stressing tendon based on the bending moment diagram. 
but if you want to also optimize the topology of the beam, like this example in a density-based case, for a simply supported beam, we later cannot embed this optimal cable. Of course, a cable here would be a parabolic cable. It cannot be embedded in the design, which was already optimized. We may be able to embed a straight cable, but this is not necessarily the optimal shape. So again, we need to somehow couple the optimization of the discrete object, in this case, a line, uh, with the continuum freeform objects. Um, so in the case of the pre-stressed concrete, which we later extended to the case of the cuts and assembly, we basically used uh, a simple projection based on a super Gaussian. So wherever there is a tendon, we basically pour concrete around it based on this super Gaussian function, this projection function, and enforce the existence of concrete around the tendon so it's completely covered by concrete. And then this density, which is basically projected uh, based on the geometric object, is later coupled to the density in the other regions, which is basically evolving free-formed uh, based on standard density-based procedures. Uh, so this is the idea, and th then we took this into the realm of, of cuts and assembly. Um, so for the case of the pre-stressed concrete, we basically have the evolution of the density, black and white, and the evolution of the shape of the tendon coupled together so that the final result basically is an optimized beam and an optimized location of the tendon, which is eventually is covered uh, completely by, by concrete. And just a slight detour, uh, just to advertise this, so our dear colleagues at the University of Ghent in Belgium uh, managed to uh, actually print this beam and, and uh, bring it into life. So it was nice to see the theoretical work somehow evolve into something more that more resembles real life. So this is the, the printed 3D um, optimized beam. Uh, back to our problem statement. So again, we're looking at optimizing the density distribution of the design and a cut or several cuts, which will decide how to partition this design and later assemble it uh, along these interfaces of the, of the partitions. So the common uh, building blocks in the density-based part are, are standard. We use a three-field representation. We have mathematical variables, density variables, which are filtered, and then uh, projected using heavy side projections. And we follow uh, the very common and popular uh, robust approach with three projections of the eroded, intermediate, and dilated uh, structures to get a better control over length scale and sharp black and white designs. Um, the line to continuum projection, so basically, the optimized line in red here, which is the cut, is then projected into the continuum grid by a super Gaussian. The super Gaussian basically has two controls. One is the size of the region that will be projected. So how big uh, the region will be around the discrete uh, line and uh, how sharp the projection will be. And of course, this sharpness um, determined by the mu factor, of course, uh, uh, affects the nonlinearity of the problem and, and we use a continuation scheme to deal with, to deal with that. Um, some small and, and dirty corners. So as many people in the projection based community, let's say uh, they've seen that before. So when you have multiple projections, so let's say you have a point in the continuum that interacts with two different cuts, you cannot just naively sum the projections because then you may get um, a double density in regions which are affected by, by both cuts. Um, so what uh, Nicolò eventually did here is, uh, and this is again uh, similar, I think, to other projection approaches, um, you use a differential minimum distance in order to determine which is the uh, minimal distance of each point from, this, from a certain cut and determine the projection based on that. And then you cannot get more than a projection of material to one. Um, as we got when we just summed the projections. Uh, and this is basically an imitation of a Boolean operation of projections on the same, on the same point in space. Um, another artifact that we had to deal with is, is uh, the sharpness of the transition. So because we have a very simple representation of the geometry over here, it's, it's a piecewise linear representation. Eventually when it is projected into the continuum grid, we may have artifacts I'm not sure everybody can see it on their screen, but you have uh, sharp jumps between the projected segments of the line. And of course, this is not realistic. Then we have two points here, which are basically black and white, even though they have very similar distances 
from the nearby uh, cut. So uh, what Nicolas suggested here is simply to filter the distances so points interact with points in a nearby region and then get a filtered or weighted average of the distance in order to get a smooth projection of the cut. So even though the underlying geometry is quite sharp and kinky, so there's a collection of lines, we get smooth projections here uh, onto the continuum grid. And this, this filtered value eventually enters the super Gaussian function for projection. Um, some other basic components of the problem foundation. So we look at this in this paper only at minimum compliance and we optimize the compliance of the eroded uh, structure and we control volumes of the dilated. So we take this mini robust approach which guarantees length scale for compliance problems. We have a modified SIMP interpolation. We always have a volume constraint on the full domain. Uh, and we usually also have a slope constraint to regularize the cut. So this can be done based on the coordinates of the cut. We can control by an aggregated manner. Um, so an aggregated constraint for all segments, we can control the slope of the cut so that we don't get too sharp corners um, in the cuts within the domain. Sensitivity analysis, uh, as you can imagine, it's just a bunch of long, uh, dirty chain rules because there are many filters and projections here. So details are, of course, in the paper. And uh, we also can supply a MATLAB code for some of the examples upon, uh, upon request. So going to the example. So we have uh, the, the, the nice thing here, I think, is there's an endless possibilities of, of what to control and what uh, kind of um, um, control you have over the geometry and material properties of this cut region or the interface between the assembled parts. So we're showing some examples here from the paper, but I think you can, you can definitely think of many, many more depending on the application and depending on the actual constraints, which I admit we, we're still not sure what are the actual constraints for welding. Um, and we didn't go into details with actual constraints uh, of other assembly, uh, assembly processes. So uh, first one here will be the maximum volume in the region of the cut. So we have a certain region defined by the cut and we want to limit the, the volume of material over there. So this will be on the left, a standard design. And this will be optimized where we see that in the region of the cut, we have uh, a, a controlled volume fraction of material. In this, in this case, 25% of the volume here is, um, is present and we automatically see a reduction of the volume along the cut compared to a naively optimized design without optimizing the cut. Um, and this can, can be applied, for example, if you want to limit the total welding energy that is applied uh, uh, in the assembly process. Um, another straightforward example will be to limit the stiffness. And of course, this can be extended also to strength via stress constraints. So if you want to find the region where we uh, need to reduce the material property of the Young's modulus, um, but we don't want to determine this beforehand. So the, the procedure will find the optimal cut in a sense of wh where is the region where we can sacrifice the stiffness based on a certain reduced stiffness that we know will, uh, will occur near the cut. So this, this example is for a 50% reduction of stiffness and it finds a certain region uh, where this is optimally located, this reduction in stiffness. And of course, this can be extended um, to stress constraints where we should expect that uh, uh, allowable stress will be different in the regions of the assembled, of the assembly uh, compared to regions far away from the assembly. Um, I think it's also nice to look at uh, uh, maximum length scale, which is very popular these days. So we took the maximum length scale formulations from the recent literature by, by some of the organizers here and embedded them. So basically over here, we're saying the cantilever can be designed without a maximum length scale limitation, but only in the regions of the cut, we do want to have a maximum length scale limitation, for example, because we want to limit the thickness of connected members in the assembly. So we have two cuts here um, in the Y direction, and we see that the length scale is, so there is a maximum length scale in position within these regions, and this is somehow smoothly adapted into the other regions which are not controlled by a maximum uh, length scale. And then we somehow are, are compromised on performance because of the maximum length scale is reduced compared to imposing a certain maximum length scale uniformly on the complete uh, design. Um, this is the evolution where you can see basically that the cut and the density distribution evolve somehow simultaneously and the shape of the cut 
adapts itself uh, to the directions of the evolving density-based bars. Uh, it's quite nice to see, I think, that these, these things act uh, simultaneously. Another example of a maximum length scale. So if we have, this is actually inspired by the actual motivation example. Okay, so the actual rib, we try to imitate it in 2D and say we have four cuts. So each of these four regions can be in a sense, in a sense um, printed in a certain AM facility. So it obeys the size of the AM facility. And then we have a cut in X and Y, and we impose again, maximum length scale uh, on this cut in order to limit the thickness of members along the cuts and we get a certain uh, design. This is of course highly non-convex and highly uh, non-linear. So I think in the paper, we also have an example of a slightly different design resulting from a slightly different um, initial guess of the cut. So uh, we need to admit that this, this result could be slightly different depending on the initial guesses. Um, last thing, we, uh, we looked at this idea of, uh, of a spatial variation of the length scale. So, uh, not necessarily having a constant filter size, uh, whether it, the filter size determines the minimum length scale or whether it determines a maximum length scale. Um, we do not have to have these constant in space. So let's say we have a certain minimum length scale within the complete domain, but within the region of the cut, we want to increase the length scale. So we get fewer and thicker members. So now within the region of the cut, Basically, the length scale or the R min, in a sense, of the filter radius is enlarged by some factor. Uh, and then the design evolves according to that. In the maximum length scale example in the bottom, this acts the same. The maximum length scale is bigger in this region of the cut uh, based on a change in the parameters of the filter radius. So we have a spatial variation, basically, of the filter radius. Um, we're listing here some related work. So we discovered this mostly during and in the end of the work and during the review of the paper. So there's actually been, I think, quite a few ideas on, uh, usually uh, they, they stem from different motivations, different applications, but different ways of embedding components and basically coupling a projection of a geometric, explicit geometric object and uh, otherwise freeform topology organization. Um, and I think the recent review by, by uh, Wein, Danning, and, and Norato, they, they actually had a chapter on this, on these hybrid methods where we uh, can couple projection-based and, and free-form topology transition. And there's quite a lot of uh, research there and, and, and I think also new applications and, and things to look at. So just to summarize this, um, we presented a coupled parameterization for concurrently designing a, a structure it's partitioned into parts and the assembly interface uh, where within this interface we can control, for example, minimal, maximum length scale, material properties, the quantity of material, the shape of the cut, different things. I think, again, the, there, there are endless possibilities here of what you can control. Um, uh, but more generally, it seems like there are a lot of possibilities of coupling uh, density-based or also level set-based topology optimization, which are basically freeform and projection-based topology organization, which is basically um, restricted and based on geometry. Um, and we may be, be able to get the best of both worlds when one of the methods is not suitable for a certain engineering problem. So uh, just to sum this up, density-based, of course, the strong points are, it gives the most design space freedom and a very smooth and well-behaved behavior, but it does have a certain limitation with respect to geometric control. While the geometry projection also known as feature mapping now in the review paper um, are explicit and they have precise geometric control, but they have a more restricted design freedom and they could be highly nonlinear because these projection functions are basically um, Boolean operations, which are smooth. So there are difficulties also there, uh, but somehow mixing the best of both of these worlds could be a, a good idea, I think. Um, and this sums up the talk. I hope I was in time and maybe we have some time for questions. Thank you. Yes, on time. Thanks, Oded, for the wonderful talk. Um, we do have some time for questions, if, if there are questions from the audience. James, may I ask a question? Fred here. Of course. Yes, Fred, go ahead. Oded, uh, thanks for the very nice presentation. Uh, I was wondering, uh, particularly if you move into the 3D setting, uh, if you think of welding, then it is very important that you can assess the whole connection area any views on how to 
uh, include in the method accessibility, say, of your uh, with your welding torch? Uh, you mean access to you? You want to have the geometric access to so the welding. The, yeah. Uh, so if you want to put, to uh, bring two parts or multiple parts together, yeah. you need to be um, able to 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 reach that uh, spot with a welding torch. Yeah, but okay, yes, I understand. So uh, we didn't think of this in the context of this because uh, we reduced the problem into a 2D problem, as you see, and uh, and just uh, the geometric partition was the main interest. But uh, just as a thought, I would I would uh, walk from your door a few doors to some direction and ask Matthias about this because I think the all the work about CNC and milling and accessibility of of milling can possibly be extended also to these welding. Um, welding torches, I think. So if you take the work of people in the community on, on milling um, and, uh, and ca casting may be too, too simple, but, but milling and, and sizes of, of, uh, of milling tools and the directions and how to uh, rotate meshes. Um, I think many of the co these components were included in Matthias's paper on CNC milling. I think this could be one idea of how to uh, how to look at the welding torch and its, mm -hmm. its visibility, basically, of the, of the assembly interface, in a sense. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Great. Maybe one more question, if anyone has one. Yes, I, uh, I have a question yes, here. Yes, Jun, go ahead. So if I can say that there's a cut in a geometry, if the cut is perpendicular to the shape, then the interface has the smallest length. Uh, and in some of your examples, I see the cut is uh, perpendicular to the bars, but in some other regions, it's a uh, not a perpendicular cut. Uh, isn't this? Um, I was thinking, what would be the reason? I, I saw the number of points to represent the cut is quite small. Couldn't this be one of the reasons? Uh, yeah. I th so I think for, I, I think Nicolo and I uh, we, we we saw this. For example, you see it here very clearly. In many, many cases, the cut tries to, even if the, if the volume fraction near the cut is not minimized or restricted, uh, so, so there's no apparent reason to reduce the amount of material, but still the cut tends to, to uh, be perpendicular to the bars, but it's not always possible, again, because of, as you say, th this is not a smooth spline and this is not a smooth representation. It's quite restricted, but we did see that in most cases, it tries to keep uh, perpendicular uh, to the cut, even though not in all cases we are quantifying the volume. So we're not restricting the volume. Uh, if we restrict the volume, of course, I would expect that to happen. And I think this is actually the case. And uh, uh, he, here even not, not didn't happen here, but we did see it in different examples uh, that it did try to cut perpendicular to the bars, but not always. So we couldn't draw a clear conclusion, but there was this tendency in many examples. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, great question. I think it's a, a lot of different things playing off each other, right, Oded? I think, yeah, uh, yeah. good question. Okay, great. So I think, uh, Oded, thank you for the wonderful keynote. I think yeah, we will move you. on to uh, the next talk. Dr. Noel, if you could share your screen. And the next talk is University from University of Colorado Boulder on adaptive level set topology optimization using hierarchical beast lines. So please go ahead. Hi. So thanks for the invitation. And yeah, I'm going to talk a bit about adaptive topology optimization. And this is a work that was uh, done with my colleagues at the University of Colorado. And it seems, OK. So the motivation behind this work was that, as you can see on the right of the image, in nature, but also in the structure that we can now build, we can have different structure that present themselves at different length scale. And the challenge of like designing such structure is that there's not a clear separation between the length scales. So you need to resolve like the design and the physics at all these different scales. And this can lead to a very large computational cost. So the idea was to develop some numerical tools that would allow us to efficiently and accurately design such structures. And to do so, we decided to do some adaptive topology optimization. So we are working within a level set XFEM framework, which means that we use our classical tool. We represent the design, as you can see here in the center, with a level set field. And then we are going to map this and build a physical model where we will 
integrate our gover governing equations. Um, both the design and the state variable fields are discretized and they are going to be interpolated using some shape functions that I uh, named here B. And usually we are using low order approximations such as uh, Lagrange basis. And then we would use a linear filter for a design variable. But in our case, we want to take advantage of those bases to be able to get some adaptivity. Um, and so we are going to use B splines. Uh, so here you see uh, that the display quadratic B splines, but we are going to work with linear quadratic and cubic B splines. Uh, they are going to be used for the design variable, so for the geometry and for the sake of simplicity, everything that you will see afterwards is using linear B splines for the state variables. So how do we use them to get a refined mesh? So you see here that I have like a coarse mesh where I interpolate with those B-spline function that you see here on the graph. And then I can refine the mesh and introduce a finer uh, basis. And then I can do this a second time. And if I just work uh, with those bases, the one that I in black are going to interpolate into my mesh. And I will end up with this situation where I will use all the bases that you can see here but some of them overlap on the same region and you lose uh, some interesting properties such as the partition of unity. So to um, get back those properties, we are going to use truncated B splines where we subtract the fine bases from the coarse ones so that we recover those properties, which is extremely convenient for finite elements. Uh, there's more on like the effect of using truncated versus non truncated in the paper if you're interested. So we are using uh, XFEM to uh, model the physics, which means that we use like all the classical XFEM ingredients. Uh, we avoid the artificial coupling, as you see here, between two phase that would be interpolated by the same basis by using uh, an enrichment strategy. Uh, we use ghost stabilization to mitigate ill conditioning. And we enforce uh, interface and boundary condition using uh, weak formulations. So now that we know how we deal with the mesh, the geometry, and how we uh, compute the physics, let's uh, see how we can do like with the optimization. So we first uh, focus on our MBB beam, uh, where we are going to minimize the compliance with a 40% mass constraint. And we are going to allow five different levels of refinement. So we are going to span from a 30 by 10 to a 480 by 160 mesh. And we refine around the boundaries of the design. Um, just as a side note, here we use uh, a strategy to have a simultaneous hole seeding. Uh, we can also use an initial seeding as the hole, as you can see on the figure here. The problem is that if you go with this strategy, you will need a very fine mesh to resolve your initial guest, which is not really favorable if you want an efficient adaptive uh, method. So what we are going to do is that we are going to compare a design that we can get on uniformly refined mesh and adaptively refined mesh. And we compare them in terms of this uh, efficiency ratio that basically compares the number of freedoms you have on your adaptive mesh versus the one you would have on the finest scale with your uniform mesh. So let's just have a look at the uniform uh, design. So we consider like four levels of refinement. And as expected, as you refine more, you have finer uh, members that appears in your design. And we also use linear quadratic and cubic B spline. And as the order uh, increase, uh, you can see that we are uh, getting smoother design. Uh, we don't use any filter here, so we just want to see like the effect of the support of these different base lines. So if we now use our adaptive strategy and we start from the two coarsest level of the mesh, you can see that we can get structures that are like not as fine as maybe the last level, but that are like, like quite uh, fine compared to the, the lowest refinement. And we have like similar performance in terms of compliance. And with the eff efficiency factor, you can see that the efficiency increase if we start from a coarser mesh and also if we use a higher interpolation order. So a good compromise is to use quadratic B-spline because you will 
get a smooth design, you don't really get anything better from the cubic, but you have a reduced cost compared to what you have in the cubic. So um, the same exam, we run the same example and the same experiment uh, in 3D, uh, which yields like roughly the same conclusion. So I'm jumping straight to another 3D example. And here we focus on a short uh, beam under pressure where we minimize both the compliance and the mass. And what we are trying to do is to generate design with different, uh, with lower and lower volume to see the effect on our adaptive strategy. And we use exactly the same strategy. We consider four level of refinement. We are gonna refine around the boundary every 25 optimization iteration. And again, we use a simultaneous fault seeding. In this case, we don't compare with the result we would get on a uniform mesh. So our efficiency ratio just compare with the number of degrees of freedom you would have on, a, on the finest uniform mesh if you were using classical finite element. So here you can see like four different designs that range from on the top left with the highest volume uh, fraction to the lowest on the bottom right. And you can see that on the, on the co top corner of each of those designs, we have the, um, the lowest refinement level and we have the highest one around the interface. And by starting from this very coarse uh, mesh, we are still able, as you see in all those circle, to get like very uh, fine members and optimal structures as we, as we would get on a uniformly refined mesh. You can also see from the efficiency factors that as your volume is dropping, the efficiency is, is uh, better and better. So as a conclusion with this adaptive strategy, we are able to uh, generate design that have similar performance to the one we have on uniformly refined mesh and we can have also those complex feature that we would get on uniformly refined mesh. And the main point that, that, uh, that, that we could observe is that if you use higher order base plan, you will promote smooth design, which will limit your need for filtering techniques. The ability to nucleate all is actually very important so that the adaptivity is like efficient. As I said before, if you start with this Swiss cheese pattern, you will need a very high refinement in the beginning, which is then detrimental to the efficiency. And there's more about this in the paper. Um, as you could also see, the refinement strategy is uh, influencing the design you get in the end. So the starting uh, refinement and like how frequently you refine has obviously an influence on what you will get in the end. And strictly in terms of efficiency, efficiency increase with the interpolation order and the coarseness of the initial mesh and for 3D problems with a drop in the volume fraction. And this is concluding my talk. Uh, thanks for your attention. And if you have any question, I'm happy to answer. Perfect, thank you. We do have time for a question or two if there's any from the audience. I have a question, Jamie, if I can. Yes, please, Guy. Yeah, thanks for a great talk, Lise. Um, so you mentioned that you can nucleate holes during the optimization, and this increases the efficiency since you don't have a, you don't need a fine mesh right off the bat. But does this also uh, lead to a better optimum? Does it make it more likely you'll get a global optimum since you don't have to make an initial guess, so to speak? You can kind of start out with a uniform topology. Um, I mean, yeah. Uh, in this case, like as we studied in the paper, we studied both strategies. So first, we we had this like Swiss cheese, as you could see, but we had a lot of holes, so we were not really like impaired in terms of like what we were getting. But of course, if you start from different initial guess, you get something different in the end. So I would say like probably, but. Because in in the case where you have this simultaneous hole seeding, yes, you can you can seed holes and then you get rid of this initial guess that is like limiting what you can get in the end. Yes. Right. Okay. Thanks. Great. We have a question from Marcus. Yes. Thanks, Lise. Great talk. Um, 
So since you you said you're using XFEM, um, I'm wondering what is the benefit of refining at the interface? Do you still need to use XFEM there? Or as you refine, you kind of could also get similar results just using classical uh, FEM with densities? So even if we use XFEM, like refining around the interface still like allow you to get a, a way better resolved geometry around the interface. Because I mean, when you cut the elements, we are we are interpolating the geometry like underneath with something we cut in a linear way. So the elements that are underlying are have linear shapes. So if we refine, we we are getting something better, and we still don't have any gray area that are like neither like fully void or fully solid. So it's still like beneficial. And in this case, it's beneficial in terms of efficiency and also of like what we are able to represent around the interface. We can represent very complex geometry and like curvature and so on. So. Okay, so so doing adaptive refinement makes XFEM even better. Yes, I would say so. Okay, cool. Thanks. <laughs> Great, thank you, Lisa. I think we'll move on to the next talk. Thanks for an excellent talk. And of course, we can come back to questions uh, after all the speakers are done. So our next speaker is uh, Professor Mike Xi, who gets the award for still being awake, I hope. It's very late, <laughs> very late in Melbourne. Thank you for joining us and uh, at this late time. Thanks, Mike. Go ahead. Thanks, Jamie, for inviting me. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk something which I did with my student, Yun Zhen He, and my colleagues, Quen Chai and Zilong Zhao. And the topic is about creating diverse and competitive structure designs through topology optimization. Um, when we do optimization, um, most of the time we're trying to find the unique and global optimal, like climbing to the top of Mount Everest. Um, but today I'm going to show you something slightly different. Um, some of you may have been to uh, this place in China called Zhang Jie. Um, you, you can see many uh, multiple peaks of similar heights, but each peak it has a slightly different shape. So the the thing I'm trying to do today is try to see how we can create diverse and competitive designs without changing the loading and boundary conditions. And by diverse, I mean that they're topology, topologically different and competitive means structurally efficient. Um, I show you one scenario where this thing becomes important because I work with many architects. Um, this is a uh, a bridge by one of my architectural friends, Professor Philip Yuan. He would build a footbridge every year in, in Tongji University. And uh, I have collaborated with him over the past three years. Every year we would um, use topology optimization to design a bridge and, uh, and uh, install it at the same site and load test with all these uh, professors. So the boundary conditions, the site and loads are exactly the same, but we, we need to produce a different looking bridge. So this, this one was actually uh, um, optimized using um, our software Amoeba and it was metal printed. And I'm going to show you some a few very simple tactics to achieve those different looking uh, topologies, but um, making sure that every design is structurally efficient. Some of the techniques are, are actually quite obvious or we actually you are using it um, unconsciously. Um, I, I, I need to say that the, this study was based on the uh, B, BSO method, but the tactics we are using can actually be applied to other optimization uh, methods equally. The reason we choose BSOP is because we are very familiar with this technique and the ESO method and BSOP technique were both uh, proposed by my colleagues and myself 
And so I've been doing a lot of work and, uh, and we, we, we are basing our work on this method. So the first tactic we can use to create different designs is we can use some of the parameters we have in topology optimization. One of such uh, parameters we are familiar with is the uh, filter radius. So if you have this very simple example, normally we would have such a design outcome for uh, the given loading and, and boundary condition. But if we just changing this filter radius, we can actually create many different shapes. Um, you, you, you must say these are local optimums. Most of the time we're trying to avoid local optima, but in this study, we are actually trying to find those local optima without sacrificing too much on the structure performance. Although we are seeing five very different shapes, but if you are looking at the uh, structure performance, um, the, the compliance or the stiffness, they, they are very close. So the stiffness, the overall stiffness only differ by less than 1.4%. So structure efficiency wise, they're, they're all very efficient. But um, the advantage of this is we have five totally different topologies for our collaborators to choose from. Um, when I started uh, working on topology op optimization, I'm all, I was always asked about the question of whether we can generate the unique, the absolute global optimal solutions. So I was uh, um, quite, Quite often I've been thinking along these lines, but the more I work with architects, the more I think in the opposite direction, because they often ask me to provide different design options for them to choose from, for them to fit in other architectural requirements. Um, the, the second um, more sophisticated, slightly more sophisticated um, tactic is to penalizing the existing design. So I show you one example we have done. Um, this is a, a, a structure um, designed by Asazaki and Sasaki using extended ESO method. And it was constructed in Qatar in two, uh, 2012. So uh, if we use traditional BISO method, we, we would see something like this if you fix the bottom two point put uniformly distributed load. Using BESO method, you would have this process. And then after 20 minutes on the laptop, you would get this shape. Uh, this is a sh shape um, built in Qatar. But because we have this uh, structure built already, so you, you, we can't build another one. <laughs> exactly like this. But it doesn't mean that we can't use topology optimization to find a, a different design for the same loading and the boundary condition. What we can do is we can, we can weaken or we can penalize the sensitivity of the materials in this existing structure so that we can um, go into a slightly different path and get a new design. So if we penalize the, the, those elements in the, in the existing structure, then we would evolve into a different structure. Depending on the level of penalty you apply to the, the first design, you will get different, uh, quite different designs. So these two structures look quite different. This one has an additional truss, but the stiffness um, or the compliance they, they are close to each other, they, they differ by 10%. Um, when we have any real, uh, uh, real project in, in large scale project in architecture, 5%, 10% is actually not that much significant because there's many other requirements that need to fit in for such a, a large scale structure. But the, the different uh, shapes 
it's actually quite critical to the architects. Uh, so this one we got by penalizing one existing design. So uh, the next one I can I show you it's it's uh, we have a deck at the middle of the bridge, and if we only consider structure performance, you would get a a, a, a bridge design like this, a two parallel trusses. If we apply some penalty to this uh, the the this uh, the existing design we would get a slightly different design. So we get this, so this is a second design. So we can, we can then apply penalty to the two, to both existing designs to get the third one, the fourth one, and so on. So we get three different designs. So we start from two parallel trusses and the second one, two parallel trusses getting closer. And the third one, there's only one uh, arch in the middle and geometrically and they look quite different but their structure performance they only differ by three percent so all three designs they look quite different but their structure performance are close they are all very uh, near to the uh, best best one so this this is again by penalizing existing designs designs and the next one is we can use constraint as a design driver okay, normally we consider constraint as some limiting factors but some sometimes we can actually use the constraints to create new features in the uh, in the outcomes um, I show you this example of a uh, a bridge type of design. So we have four bottom corners fixed, apply uniformly distributed load. The, the slight modification in the second model is we say we, we need to leave a gap in the middle. And so you can put material anywhere except the gap. So this geometric constraint, we use it to as a positive uh, design driver to get a different design. So the, the, the top one, we can put material anywhere. The one at the bottom, we need to leave a small gap in the middle. And by doing this, we get two different designs. And if you compare the stiffness, and you will, you will find the stiffness for the bottom design is about 12% worse off compared to the top one. Uh, you might say the, the one at the bottom is, is much worse than the one at the top. But if you're talking to, to, to the architect, they, they would think differently because the objective is to, to design a bridge. The one on the top is, is not really a bridge. It's more like a, a bench. So the one at the bottom, it's actually taking into consideration of the functional requirement of a bridge. Although this, the structure performance in terms of the stiffness is a bit lower, it actually uh, fulfills the requirements of the function more. And the other one, um, the using constraint for driving the design is something we, we quite often use in our topology of nation is we specify non-design domains. So we can specify say this A, B, C, these parts should never be removed. And we, we got four different designs, the one on the top without any non-design domain and the one, the, the other three has some non-design domain. They look quite different, but their structure performance, again, are quite close. And um, this one we obtained by say, um, artificially uh, penalizing part of the structure so we can um, penalize the uh, sensitivity of the lower half of this design domain slightly. We can get, get different design, depending on the level of penalty we apply to the lower half. We get these three different designs. In terms of topology, they are quite different, but their structure performance are all very close to each other. The next one is we can 
simply introduce some random holes in the initial design. Say we can dig some holes randomly in the initial design, but these holes can be filled later on during optimization process if they are required structurally. So the one, so we have two solutions. One is without a random holes. The, the one at the bottom has some random holes. So if you do this, every time you write with a random pattern, you would get a different design. They look totally different, but their structure performance are again, very close. Um, the final tactics, tactic we have introduced is we can combine the traditional topology optimization with genetic algorithm. So um, when we use genetic algorithm, we can do crossover and mutation to the elements so that their sensitivity rankings would be um, altered in this process. I just show you one simple example of that bridge with a deck in the middle. Um, the one on the top is a traditional BSO and the one at the bottom, we, we combine BSO with genetic algorithm. It's actually much faster when you add genetic algorithm. So it, it converges in probably 60% of the iterations compared to a traditional BSO, but the, the shapes are different. And if you run, run this um, um, BSO with a genetic algorithm, because there are several different parameters in GA, so you can get many different designs through the second approach. And if you compare their performance, again, they're quite close. The difference is only 1.5%. So um, we have, we have uh, demonstrated several very simple and some are very obvious approaches, but they are very effective for achieving topologically different and structurally efficient designs. And these kind of diverse and competitive designs are very, are, are very important to architects and other designs. And the same, same tactics can be applied to other topology optimization methods. And we have published these uh, five methods in two papers. The first three tactics were published in Extreme Mechanics Letters last year. And the last two tactics uh, were published recently in Fine Elements in Analysis and Design. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Mike. So I think in the interest of uh, keeping on schedule, we'll go to the next speaker. But if you have a question for Mike, please note it, uh, note it down, write it down, and we'll come back at the end of uh, the last speaker and have an open discussion and please ask it then. So thanks, Mike, for that great talk. Thank you. Uh, yep. Our next speaker is uh, Professor Kai James. I think, Mike, if you can stop sharing. Yeah. Yep, we may need to do that. Okay. And and Kai, you can put that up. Um, and he's coming to us from University of Illinois. Great. Uh, great. Go ahead, Kai. Thanks, Jamie. Um, so I'm going to be uh, discussing the methodology and results from a paper that was published earlier this year in uh, International uh, Journal for Numerical Methods and Engineering. Uh, it was authored by myself and my PhD student, Zillian Kang. And so this paper deals with uh, using topology optimization to design structures and mechanisms containing shape memory alloys. So these are a class of uh, metallic active materials that exhibit shape change or strains in response to thermal loads. And one of the really nice thing about these materials is that it allows you to get very fluid uh, motion, uh, a type of bio-inspired uh, mechanism design, because you really have an infinite degree of freedom, uh, an infinite number of degrees of freedom, uh, as opposed to traditional robotics, where motion is sort of limited to a, a, a discrete set of uh, joints. So the idea is that we can uh, harness this uh, shape memory capability to create a programmable motion where the uh, the desired trajectory is encoded in the material distribution. And so we want to use topology optimization in order to do that. So there are two key contributions to this paper. 
Uh, the first is uh, we developed a novel uh, topology optimization formulation. And here I'm speaking specifically about the way in which we parameterize the design through a material interpolation scheme. And then secondly, we derived and implemented a bi-level adjoint sensitivity analysis formulation, which captures the transient and path dependent nature of the thermal mechanical response of the materials. So <clears throat> the shape memory response, right? This motion in response to a thermal load is really due to phase transformation within the material that's triggered by a latent heat exchange. And so the transformation occurs as you cool the material, it's gonna transition from an austenite phase to a much stiffer crystalline martensite phase. And associated with that transition, in the case where we're modifying the temperature at constant stress, we will observe fairly large changes in shape or length associated with a relatively small change in temperature. And that is associated with the transition from austenite to martensite. So that's one of the ways in which the shape memory effect manifests. And this is referred to as the two-way shape memory effect since it is fully reversible. The other manifestation is what's referred to as super elasticity or sometimes pseudo elasticity. And so we can get this highly inelastic stress strain curve. Um, and by applying a strain in combination with a temperature cycle, we can observe reaction forces or stresses that are much greater than what we would experience with a simple elastic material. And so the idea is that we want to be able to harness that capability to achieve a type of mechanical advantage in our mechanism design. So the uh, constitutive model is quite involved. We provide all the details in the paper. I'll just point out a couple things. So we're assuming small strains. So the total strain is going to be a superposition of three components. We have a portion of the strain that is due purely to elasticity. We have a portion of the strain that is due to thermal effects. And then we also have a portion of the strain that is due to transformation from the austenite to the martensite phase. And that strain, that portion of the strain is going to be a function of the local stress, the local temperature, and this parameter Z, which represents the martensite volume fraction. So that's a number between zero and one, and it represents the extent to which the material at a given location is in the martensite phase versus the austenite phase. And the evolution of the transformation strain is going to be proportional to the rate of change of the martensite volume fraction. Uh, where this uh, parameter here is the transformation tensor, which is an intrinsic material property of the shape memory alloy, which we typically, uh, we typically obtain using experiments. So for the finite element implementation, again, it's quite involved and we, we do provide the details in the paper, but I'll just point out a couple things. So we have two different levels of residual equations. So at the global level, we have these R residuals, which uh, describe equilibrium at the nodes of the finite element mesh. And additionally, at the local level, we have these H residuals, uh, which correspond uh, to the state at the Gauss points of each element. And so we use those residuals to solve for the local stress, strain, and martensite volume fraction. So, since it's nonlinear, we do a newton raphson procedure. And since it's bi-level, we have this sort of double or nested loop in which this inner loop is used to solve or to resolve the local residuals. And we have this outer loop, which is used to resolve the global residuals. So for the topology optimization problem, so we're gonna be using a two-phase topology optimization. Um, we have a void phase and a solid phase, and the solid phase is what's going to contain our shape memory alloy. And we have two different types of problems that we're going to solve. Uh, so in the first one, we're leveraging the two-way shape memory effect. So the objective is really to maximize displacement at a particular degree of freedom. And though this is similar to geometric advantage in our classic uh, mechanism design problem. And in the other class of problem, we want to optimize the, uh, 
mechanical advantage, so the output force. And here we're leveraging the super elasticity property of the material. And so the objective is to maximize the ratio of output force to the input force. So for the material interpolation scheme, it's very similar to a classical SIMP model. The effective stiffness of the material is gonna be our design parameter R raised to the power of P, the penalization constant, times the Young's modulus of the raw material. We similarly interpolate the volume fraction, but without penalization. And we also are going to uh, interpolate the effective change in temperature. Uh, as we go from solid to void, we recognize that the void phase doesn't actually undergo transition. And so we can capture that uh, dependence by interpolating the effective change in temperature at those void elements. And I'll also note here that uh, we're assuming a uniform temperature. So we're not modeling the coupled thermal conductivity pro uh, problem. Instead, we're treating the temperature as an input to the forward analysis problem. And so we'll assume that the temperature is constant throughout the volume. And in that way, we can treat the temperature as a proxy for uh, the time step in our forward marching transient analysis. The adjoint sensitivity analysis, um, the derivation again is quite involved, but I, I do want to point out a couple features of it. So since uh, the problem is transient and path dependent, we're going to be solving for a unique adjoint vector for each time step in our forward analysis. And just like any path dependent problem you would encounter in plasticity or viscoelasticity, uh, we start out by solving for the adjoint vectors corresponding to the final time step in the sequence. And then we're going to step back in time, noting the coupling between adjoint vectors corresponding to adjacent time steps. And so in reverse order, we're going to solve each adjoint vector one by one. Uh, here, at each time step, we've got two adjoint vectors to solve, or two sets of adjoint vectors to solve for. This lambda corresponds to the global adjoint vector, and gamma corresponds to the uh, local adjoint vector. And there's one for each Gauss point in the match. So uh, we have a couple example problems. Um, and this first one is one where we want to take advantage of the two-way shape memory effect. So what we wanna do is maximize the output displacement at this degree of freedom of interest. It's located at this location where we're applying a small nominal input force so that we do have some requisite constant stress within the structure. And we apply a limit on the instantaneous uh, elastic deflection so that we do maintain some requisite stiffness within the structure. So this image shows us the solid void interface. So this red outline uh, is gonna represent the material distribution of the optimized design. And the evolution that you're observing is uh, we're simulating the cooling process. So as we cool the optimized design from 290 Kelvin to 200 Kelvin, we see it expanding outward, which is the opposite effect that we would expect due to pure thermal expansion. And so that tells us that indeed, this motion is due to the two-way shape memory effects and the internal phase transformation. The other example problem that we show is a mechanical advantage type problem. So the boundary conditions are those of a traditional force inverter. We've got an input force on the left-hand side. We want to maximize the magnitude of the output force, which we want to be pointing in the negative direction. So this is the optimal material distribution. And <clears throat> here, the thermal expansion is actually helping us, right? So we know that as we cool the structure in order to affect that transition from austenite to martensite phase, uh, it's going to want to shrink. And so that's going to get us our negative output force. But we're able to partition the total output force to resolve its component that is due to pure thermoelastic effects and a second component that is due to transformation. And we see that, in fact, the, transform the force due to transformation is greater than the force due to pure thermoelasticity. Uh, and we have this additive effect. So we've essentially enhanced the uh, force multiplication power 
by leveraging the super elastic property of the material. All right, so just to summarize, um, so we use uh, topology optimization uh, to optimally leverage the inelastic uh, super elasticity and two-way shape memory effects of shape memory alloys. Um, and we use a material interpolation scheme in which we interpolate not only the effective material properties, but also the effective temperature change over the course of the simulation. Uh, we derived and implemented a path, point, path dependent transient adjoint formulation for computing the design sensitivities. We present two examples, uh, one designed to take advantage of the two-way shape memory effect, the other designed to take advantage of super elasticity. And for our future work, right now we're uh, looking at including the coupled conductivity problem. So actually that paper is underway right now. Uh, and we've got some interesting results in which we are able to account for the time dependent heat diffusion problem, which is coupled to the thermal mechanical response analysis. Um, and so that is going to lead to much more realistic results. We can actually simulate the joule heating, which we know is going to be non-uniform throughout the body and which is typically used to trigger the shape memory response in these materials. So that's our next step. And then ultimately, we want to look at more complicated geometries, uh, printing 3D mechanisms that we can actually fabricate and validate experimentally in the lab. And, and that's sort of our ultimate goal. Uh, so, and also just to acknowledge, uh, this is part of a broader project on uh, design using multifunctional materials, which is funded by uh, the National Science Foundation in the US. And uh, thank you to all for uh, your attention and for attending. Great, thank you, Kai. So maybe we have time for one very, very quick question and then uh, we'll come back to it in the discussion if there's a quick question. Or a clarification. Okay, if not, we'll we'll come back to in the discussion. Thanks, Kai, very much. Thanks, Jim. Okay, our, our last talk will be Joe Alexanderson from University of Southern Denmark. Joe, take it away. All right, you see my screen? Yes. Great. All right, so thanks for having me. It's an honor to give a presentation here today. So I'm presenting some work I did together with some colleagues at Hunan University in China. Uh, so I've uh, made Tao's name here bold because he's the star of the show who did most of the work. So we recently published this in the International Journal of Heat and Mass Transfer earlier this year. So I'm going to talk about topology optimization of heat sinks for instantaneous chip cooling. And we did that using a transient Soto 3D model. So why are we doing this? So uh, electronics are becoming uh, more and more powerful. We have ever increasing power density of these uh, smaller components. They're getting smaller, they're getting more powerful. So there's some serious uh, thermal management issues arising here. Um, Electronics are inherently transient. You often have a varying thermal power output because you have a varying load on these chips. So inherently we have a, a transient system. So here we see a, a heat source that is oscillating. We might also need a fast response for a sudden peak in load. So imagine your CPU all of a sudden gets a huge load. You start uh, a computation. You want to quickly cool it down. And that's sort of the idea that we're working with here. So most CPUs, they have like a maximum temperature limit at which they begin uh, throttling down the, the speed. So you lose performance. So above this limit, we don't really want to be there too long at least. So we are sort of treating the critical case that uh, there's no cooling system until this limit is, is, uh, is reached. And then we begin the, the cooling system to, to sort of uh, reduce the temperature rise as much as possible. So we want to lower the temperature fast. So usually we're working with the steady state performance, which is like after a long time under a constant load. And that's not really uh, applicable in electronics because your CPU might not be working hard after 100 seconds. So we really need to treat this short time frame and this instantaneous performance. 
And that requires a time dependent simulation model. Uh, and as we all know, this is usually computationally expensive because you have to step through time. You have to save all the time steps for your joint sensitivity analysis. Um, so the thought is, can we maybe introduce a simplified model in order to make each of these time steps cheaper? So recently, I also published a review paper together with Kaspar and Dresden on the topology optimization of flow-based problems. And uh, one of the things we saw was that actually only 7% of the uh, 186 papers we included uh, treat transient problems. So uh, as a lot of uh, problems in real life, and especially electronics, are transient. This is definitely an area we need to work on as a community to, to expand. But there is this issue with computational cost. So with respect to heat sink design, often you see these very simple geometries, pin fins, uh, straight fins, or even these more, more slightly more complicated slanted fins. And then you kind of have the other side, which for instance is these topology optimized heat sinks that we did for LED lamps that are very, very complicated and very complex uh, to manufacture. So we, this work is sort of in between. So we're working with these extruded profiles and then we're using topology optimization to design the cross sections of these extruded profiles. So uh, this Soto 3D model is not something we've come up with. So it was proposed by Hertel et al back in 2018. So what it essentially does is you have some uh, extended or extruded heatsink geometry. So it has to be constant uh, cross-sectional area out of plane here. You have some heat source at the bottom. So that will be our electronics chip. We then have this embedded in a channel. We have an inlet and an outlet. This is pressure driven flow. Uh, what you then do to simplify it is you make a cut plane that cuts through the channel and the heat sink. So you kind of get this uh, representative area down here. And then we couple that to a base plate layer uh, by using a, a, a yeah, interface heat transfer coefficient essentially. So what Hertel did was like a heuristic uh, way of, of setting this uh, coupling coefficient uh, more or less at the same time, Seng et al. presented their approach where they calculate the effective coupling coefficient using a reference geometry. And that's the same way we've done. So we've used this, for instance, a straight heat, a straight fin heat sink as our reference to find this uh, value for the simplified model. Another way you could do it is uh, the way of Jan, Jan Adel from 2019, where they derived the values uh, based on some analytical assumptions. Yeah. So to look at the design, so this design is optimized for the lowest temperature after one second. Um, so we see the blue here is solid material. I believe it's aluminum. And then we have air cooling here. You see we have the flow passing through the heat sink. This is the channel layer temperature distribution. And this is the base plate. So this is the temperature of the chip essentially. And then it's the average of this we want to minimize after one second. Here we see the temperature trends in this one second window. The black and the purple are like these regular uh, straight fin heat sinks. And uh, the, we started from different initial guesses and the best one was quite a bit better after one second here. If we then compare it to the steady state design, we see that the design is actually substantially different. This is much more aerodynamically streamlined where you have much more sharper features. And this uh, actually doesn't use the allowable volume because it doesn't need to. It actually wants a lot of convection, it wants these high velocities it's able to get. Uh, if we look at the short-term performance, as expected, our design optimized for the instantaneous performance performs significantly better than the steady state design but at the cost of performing significantly worse at the long-term timescale. But again, in electronics, this long-term timescale might not even be relevant. So, so that really has to be taken into account. Uh, that was for, as you see here, actually, so 
our sort of limit temperatures is 90, so that's where we kick in the uh, the cooling. But you see here, we actually never get below this limit again. So obviously the cooling isn't good enough. So we switch to water cooling here. Uh, we get a slightly different design, but still these more stubby features and sort of these streamlined features. Now we see that we're able to, it's also moving a little bit faster. So it's a higher pressure gradient, but we're now seeing that we're actually able to cool it down below the 90 degrees faster than the reference design. If we look at the long-term temperature evolution, we see that it sort of reaches uh, the lower uh, limit, which is these 55 degrees for, for its for the computer chip we looked at, it is also reached faster with the optimized design. If we look at some practical conditions, so like I said, the cooling kicks in when we reach 90 degrees. So that's sort of our upper limit. Then we optimize it to cool down as fast as possible. Uh, then we leave it running until we reach the lower limit, which is these 55 degrees. And then we turn off the cooling system again and let it go back up to the 90s, turn it on again. And this is the way we envision this cooling system to go. But essentially uh, the time from 90 to 55 is significantly faster for the optimized design. The time back up to 90 is more or less the same, but Doing this way, we are also using significantly less pumping power. So we are saving about 67% of the energy by using this optimized design. And that was it, very short. This is a list of references. And if any questions, I'm happy to take them. Great, thank you, Joe. Uh, yes, we do have time for questions specifically for Joe. I have a question. Good morning, I have a question. Oh, okay. Go ahead. I'm not sure who said that, so go ahead. <laughs> Niels, okay, do you want to go ahead? I can take my question then. Yep. So, so this is maybe just me not knowing enough about electronics, but why is it the average temperature over the chip that you're after? Isn't yeah. the chip going to burn out or shouldn't it be the maximum temperature at any point at yeah. any given time? Yeah, that would make sense uh, because you would uh, maybe... Uh, Maybe it's not as important on the chip level, but as like, well, if it's an integrated system, then you'll definitely have some hot spots, which would be where you would want to cool it. So the maximum would make more sense. But as I'm sure you're aware, maximum is not as nice as, as uh, average <laughs> in a numerical sense, at least. But, but yeah, it would make sense uh, like, to do Here's it. a couple of P norms or, yeah. or PS functions could deal with it. Yeah. Okay. But you're, you're completely right, because you don't want, I mean, we didn't observe any specific, uh, high, specifically high uh, local hotspots, but that could be the case for sure in the general uh, application. It would sure be interesting to see how the designs look yeah. if you change to that objective. Right? Okay. Thank you for a great presentation. Thank you. Is there a second Hi. question for Joe? Yeah. Hi, James. Um, Hi, Ahmed. How are you? Hey. Good, Could good. I ask good. a question? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much, very much for a nice presentation. The, in all of your work, do you have any constraint on their, for your pressure drop? Because this is one of the most important thing in design of this type of system. Right. So we're prescribing a given pressure drop. So uh, for the water cooled system, it was, we prescribed a pressure difference of 50 Pascal, I believe. Um, so we sort of prescribe that in the physical model. Uh, what do we, what do we spend on, on this cooling? Yeah. So it's automatically uh, constrained in that sense. Great. Well, thanks Joe for the presentation. Um, maybe you could stop sharing yeah. your screen at this point. Um, before opening up, the floor to everyone. I just want to remind you that the next uh, webinar will be September 22nd. So again, please mark your calendar. Um, I think we can go a little bit longer than the allotted time. June, is that is that correct? Uh, so, but it, but um, of course, feel free to drop out when you need to. It's good to see everyone. I'll say that now before we lose people. But uh, I guess we'll now we'll open it up for for questions from anyone, for any of the speakers. Yes, yeah, so that good. I have a question uh, for Mike uh, regarding these um, yeah, uh, tailored for architects uh, work because it's, <laughs> uh, it's very nice. 
So when you say you're penalizing, you're penalizing a design. So let's say you have the number one design, the best design, then you want to penalize it to get the number two. How is this yeah. actually done? So are you limiting the overlap between the designs or are you, so uh, do you ensure some, some variation? Or do you quantify the variation between best design, second best, third best, or is it, how no, is this formulated? Um, once you got the, the first design, so the, the leftover material is in the final design. Then when you do the next evolution, or when you do the next uh, optimization, every element has a sensitivity. So you, you, you're penalizing the sensitivity of the element. If this element exists in the previous design, but then you don't get two designs which completely do not overlap. You still have some overlap. So some of the penalized sensitivities still lead to existence of material in these points. You do some, have some overlap. Yeah, you will still have some overlap because you're not killing. You're not saying you can't have that material. Um, uh, absolutely. You are saying you're, you're just pro providing some penalty. So the, the most important parts of the structure will still remain, but some less important ones due to the penalty will disappear. Okay, thank you. And Mike, have you thought about sort of adapting that penalization? So if, it, if a member shows up in the second and third and fourth design, you, you increase that penalty magnitude to, to really drive it, drive it away. Have you thought about that or tried that? Yeah, you, you could. Uh, we well, I showed one example where I penalized two, the two previous designs. Mm -hmm. So once gotcha. you got the third one, you can penalize this the three, three even, even more. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Gotcha. Okay. Other questions? Yes, John. Go ahead. Yes, I also have a question for Mike. Uh, I work a lot with uh, industrial designers. They also want to have diverse design results. I meanwhile, they uh, besides, they want to get different results, and they also want to get involved in the optimization process. So, uh, I don't know whether when you're working with uh, architects, whether they also have this requirement to to modify the design on the fly, so that the design will meet some predefined pattern or uh, predefined curvature requirement, something like that. Um. The two parts, quite often, um, because they only pay you pay you the fee once. <laughs> if you can provide ten different options for them to choose for the same price, they're happy. And also, they because architects they have many other considerations. They they don't really they're not really interested in the one hundred percent structure performance. If it's ninety percent, it's to them it's the same. It's structure efficient design you're providing to them. And there's some um, some other features that you can you can use as a non-design parts or you have a fixed voice. These things can be specified in the design, but that's not what I was trying to do. So we are not trying to um, change any boundary conditions or or loading conditions. But through different algorithms, we 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 try to come up with different designs while maintain the structure performance or we say sacrifice 5% of the structure mm -hmm. performance in order to get multitude of different shapes. Yeah. Isn't there such a case when you present 10 designs to the architect, they say, oh, I want uh, a region A in this design, I want region B in the other design, and could you combine these different features in a unique design? Isn't there such a requirement? Like and they like uh, different parts of different designs. That that would be the you pre-fixing some parts of your design domain, so that that feature would never change according to the structure performance. That's yeah. very restricted. Yeah. Yeah. This uh, maybe you can say it's restricted, but once you restrict it, it can actually drive into something unexpected. Yes. So it, it is a design driver rather than only constraints. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, thank you. Great, other questions? Yeah, Fred, go ahead. 
Good morning, everyone. I have yeah. a question for Professor Alexanderson. Uh, yeah. My question is um, how or why did uh, they choose this uh, function, uh, objective function for this, uh, for this uh, project? Which function, sorry? Yes, uh, the objective function. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, it's we just chose it because it's uh, what we're yeah, used to applying to these thermal problems. It's derived from the thermal compliance. So just choosing the, the average uh, sort of ensures for most problems. So here, the design domain is pretty small and compared to sort of the flow. So it's quite hard for it to make local uh, high temperatures. So the the average temperature of the base plate works quite well. Fred, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. So uh, I would like to have a question uh, from uh, for you, Joe, and uh, yeah. maybe you can comment on the on the following, Joe. Uh, looking at temperature uh, in these electronic components. If you really go into the industry and the devices, uh, what what is the important thing? Is that the temperature, or is that the thermal mechanical deformations and stresses which cause uh, damage of the device? So, is temperature or is the the, the the mechanical damage? I think it's both. So, I actually just attended an electronics cooling conference mm -hmm. uh, virtually not too long ago. And, and they had a, a whole fourth of the conference was devoted to the mecha uh, thermal mechanical issue. So, that's certainly the, again, because you have this cycling, cyclic load that uh, you have uh, rising temperatures and so on. And then you have cooling, and, and the thermal mechanical aspect is definitely huge. Uh, with respect to the reliability of electronics. So that should also be taken into account. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. that's the follow-up argument. Oh, yeah. OK, yeah. clear. Thanks. Niels, did you have a question? Good. Yes, I have a question for Lisa, if she is still present. Hello? Yeah, I'm still here. Ah, perfect. Yes. So, <laughs> so I can see that you, you, get, you gain quite a reduction in degrees of freedom. But could you maybe tell a little bit, I guess there's no free lunch. So what is the cost of doing the adaptivity? Um, so, I mean, the, the cost of doing the adaptivity is that, like, we don't do it like every iteration. So we do it like in the example that I show every 25. Mm -hmm. um, but um, actually building the refined mesh is, is quite fast. Okay. Because this is starting from your bottom level and you just refine like along the interface right now. It's not like you're refined everywhere. And it's also, so that there's not like you're super, like we don't spend most of the time in doing the refinement. No. We spend most of the time in doing analysis and sensitivity analysis. Okay, but then- Only you refine or you're also coarsen? So we, we have both. Uh, but the thing is that the coarsening is an effect of the fact that we start the refinement from the basis mesh. So if you don't have to refine there, you just don't refine, and then it's coarsened. Okay, but since it's not so expensive, why are you only doing it? Why 25? Why that magic number? Why do we do it? Why do you only do it every 25th iteration if it's so, not expensive? Yeah, so like we tried a different... Uh, different scenario and I mean this has an influence on like what you get we did it like every 25 because actually like after like those 25 it was like um, the design was uh, somehow converged on the refined mesh we were having at the moment and then we were refining again but in the paper we have like this setting where we do like 20 I think 10 25 and 50 and of course, if you do it like all the time, it's a bit more expensive. And if you do it less, I mean, it's less expensive, obviously. So you have to find a compromise between like doing it all the time and. Good, and, and maybe I have one more question and this is probably because I'm not too much into splines, but the design parameterization, 
in, in the, you have that totally decoupled from the analysis, right? Uh, right now, uh, because like in this example, we use like we can use linear to cubic feet time for the design only. Uh, the the um, the physics, uh, so all the state variable, they are with linear baselines. But when we refine this couple, like they live on the same refined mesh. That was yeah, that was the part I didn't get. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ahmad, you had your hand up. Yeah. Yes, I have a follow-up question with the laser. So in the any adaptive mesh, when you are performing the adaptation, you are changing the underlying design space, yes? So have you solved um, any of your example that you show us with a finer mesh that you achieve when uh, you have the best adaptation? Uniform fine mesh to see you get the same solution. So yeah, we, we did comparative uh, studies also when we started from the finest mesh and then we allowed the, the adaptive refinement. We were like roughly getting the same, the same thing um, as using just the uniform because we start from the finest and so we just coarsened. So the, the mesh that you choose to start your adaptive strategy from, like how fine it is, this influence what you get in the end. But you always have something that is improved with respect to the initial mesh that you choose. Okay, thank you. Ben, you have your hand up? Yes, yes go ahead. Uh, Yeah, I have a question to you. So you consider the tra <clears throat> transient problems. How do you decide uh, determine the time is from you know the requirement of the electronic devices or is some durable life or something else right in in this case it was uh, pretty arbitrary so uh, we're still in the academic problems so so yeah you're completely right because should it be should it be 0 0.5 should it be one should it be 10 seconds that the uh, kind of certainly depends on the situation uh, this was just yeah, to see see how it's, uh, it affects the design at sort of a, a certain. But of course, if we chose maybe two seconds instead of one, maybe the design will look different. And then you're like, which one should I use? That's a very good question. And uh, it will definitely depend on the situation. But I think it deserves more work to look into. Can we somehow maybe find a way of doing this without specifying a certain time? So, is there some other mechanisms we can look into? But, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Do you question. get a very different designs for different seconds? Um, I'm not sure if Tao tried that, so so I don't know to be honest. But okay. uh, potentially, I I wouldn't rule it out. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, if I could take my privileges chair and ask Kai a question. Uh, so you, the, the two examples that you showed, they look like sort of structural examples too, right? Like the sort of the compliant mechanism and the two bar solution. Have you found any or, or, or come up with any examples that could really, you know, highlight a very different shape that we wouldn't see just purely from a mechanical efficiency point of view or, or yeah, mechanical behavior point of view? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so all of those, you, I mean, if you, treated it as linear elasticity, you get very similar structures. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I mean, our, we anticipate that as we move to more complex boundary conditions, 3D will start to get less intuitive geometries. Uh, we did validate the, the underlying design philosophy by uh, performing a simple linear elasticity based topology optimization. And then taking that optimized design and performing a thermal mechanical analysis with phase transformation and everything else. Uh, and we did notice a difference. So, so it's not immediately visible in the geometry of the structure, but these designs do actually outperform designs that do not account for the nonlinear uh, phase transformation during the optimization process. Uh, even though it's not immediately obvious, there, there was some, um, appreciable difference in the thermal mechanical performance when you actually take into account the nonlinearity. Gotcha. Uh, but yeah, we're still looking for a sort of a flagship problem where we get something that you can look at and say, yeah, this has, this is definitely different from linear elasticity. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Thanks. So maybe one for Oded. Um, so I was thinking when you're talking about, you can extend this different ways. Um, splicing came immediately to mind, right? And, and larger structures and splicing structures together. You showed that you can change modulus. Um, it see, would that be one approach to do it? That's my first question. My second question is the number of cuts. Um, do you envision a way to, to have that be part of the decision variable? Um, how many, how many times should I cut the structure and, and that kind of thing? Yeah, so I will answer the second question because I, I'm not sure I understood the first, so we will go back to that uh, later. But sure. I think, well, once you introduce a, a discrete variable, like the number of cuts and everything becomes more uh, involved, right? So um, I think for practical purposes, if you're not looking at something very complicated, then it's better to, uh, to re-optimize re with the number of cuts known in advance, I think. Um, that, that but the, but the geometric place. objects could combine, right? Or, or are they separate? Yeah, they're in their separate zones. They definitely um, could combine. So you could think of so you could start with ten and end up with eight that overlap. But I wouldn't. Uh, well, it may be more complicated to to have a decision variable on the actual number of cuts. So sure, sure. Um, and regardless of that, I think it's uh, the overall approach is not limited to uh, the number of objects. So I think it's quite flexible in the sense of what type of objects and uh, uh, their parameterization and how many they are. But um, a, a, an actual discrete variable, I think that, that would be more complicated. Gotcha, okay. Yes. And for the first question, what was that about the splice? Right, so, so uh, you, you mentioned welding specifically and, and Fred sort of got at this a little bit with, with tool access. Um, but you think about bolted connections, right? So bolted connections and maybe splice plates, right? Adding to the structure to make that actual eventual connection. Um, I could see doing that through the modulus, but you could also imagine, you know, including a, a geometry that you add in along the cut, like, a, you know, plates or something like that to actually make the connection. Um, seems like that would be a straightforward yeah, extension. If your geometric object is well defined, like, like, like uh, plates and bolted uh, connections, then definitely you can embed them. I think, uh, again, the overall approach yeah. And it's, it's similar also to other things that have been done. You can know the shape of your embedded object and you can design the shape of your embedded object. Um, regardless of that, it's, it's again a projection of a geometric object and then coupling it to the overall freeform domain. But the geometric object can be defined beforehand and it could be also optimized like in our case. Yep. Um, yeah, so I think- Great. Any uh, any last questions? So thanks thanks to the speakers. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us. It was a really enjoyable session, um, especially during this busy time when semesters are starting up. And uh, uh, and thank you, Mike, for staying up this late <laughs> with us. Um, and hopefully we'll see everyone again on September twenty second. So Jun, any uh, final wrap up words? Um, no, I think uh, we will see you everyone on the twenty second. Yeah, great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everyone.